Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and what will, in fact, be the final show before I take a break to go and do a Normandy tour for a week and then come back again in the sort of second week of October. So enjoy this one because it's you've got a gap to catch up on all the old ones. And uh, I only got back myself from a day with James Fenelon. If you've seen the shows um, about Varsity and uh, 11th Airborne with James, he was in Normandy and I've just got back about 20 minutes ago. Then I had a beer and um, and I'm, I've literally just sat down like a minute ago. Anyway, you know who we are, what we're talking about. We've got Michael Ackerman back here and we're looking at Omaha Beach. We're looking at Vida Stonzo 68 and probably into 69. And then we're going to look at more stuff in the future. But um, good afternoon, Mike. How are you today? Very well, Paul. Thanks for having me back for more of this uh, awesome nerdism. You know, is, it uh, is. I we we were just, you know, talking about that that nerdiness of examination of Parkinson. We were doing it this week. We we were chatting back and forth on Facebook about Cota's draw and Vida's yep. at seventy, and you know, it never ends. Is it that that that's the thing we we kind of realized the last time we were talking is that sure there are books about Omaha Beach. Sure, we we've, we've broken down. Here's what this bunker was, but there's still a level of detail to go and another level of detail to go. And we're realizing we're only scratching the surface of of, of discoveries. We are, and it's just it's amazing that it's taken this long. You know, thank God for modern technologies because uh, you know we've been able to discover. I've been able to discover things, you know, just through photo analysis. My friends. Um, uh, John Sfida, who's a good friend of mine, yeah. we uh, we look at photos all the time. Go back and forth. Oh, look at this! Look at this little dot right here. What does that mean? And stuff like that. And uh, it's like get get a better quality version of that photo. Get a better quality version. So yeah, it's it's amazing that it's taken this long, but there is no limit really to uh, what we can discover. You're right. The the, the 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 increase in quality of photos available, which we have to say, us Brits, the Americans, you're you're leading the way in that in a, in having these available as TIFFs and high resolution JPGs and stuff. You know, and those who are watching this who've got the old green books where you get kind of a dot matrix almost printed, like really low resolution, washed out colors picture of Omaha Beach, and now we'll be able to look at these files that are you know, 25 megabytes TIFFs and bring them up on the screen. As you do, go into that microscope and do what the hell is that behind that thing there? And then out come the books. So, um, That's well, right. uh, uh, well, here we are. So I'll let you bring up your PowerPoint and we'll just, as you know what the, it's like, for, folks, we just kind of dive in and talk about stuff and I'm going to let Michael lead the way and fire away with your questions and comments because that's the thing. Each time we do this, someone watching adds something else that we didn't know and puts a little thing there and go, oh, that's interesting. And and it's it's that collaborative um, process that is so cool. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So today, um, if people who watched uh, the previous episodes, we talked about, um, we talked a lot about uh, Les Moulins, which was the, um, the, uh, the, the, the little uh, hamlet there at uh, St. Laurent sur Mer that came down from St. Laurent and went onto the beach. So we talked a lot about that. And then we talked about WN66. And uh, so now in part two here, we're going to continue with the German Widerstandsnest of uh, Les Moulins with WN67 and WN68. So let's get started here. So a little recap. Like I just said, obviously, you know, Stuttgart St. Laurent established in 1942. Uh, this is stuff we covered in the previous video, obviously. Yep. Les Moulins is... Dem is a lot of Les Moulins is demolished throughout uh, 1942 or 1943. Um, WN66 is established down there on the beach. At first, it was uh, WN69, or I'm sorry, WN29, but then uh, became WN66. And then, so now down, down on the beach there, so now we're going to move back up to the escarpment to WN67. And this is a very, very interesting uh, resistance nest. So WN67 East. Now in the autumn of 1942, the area was known as WN29A. So, and it consisted of a couple small little improvised positions along the plateau. Uh, after the Aquatint incident of that year, an observation post was established. Now the Aquatint incident, we talked about that in the previous video, British commandos accidentally landed directly on directly in front of Les Moulins in uh, September of 1942. It was a big fiasco. And uh, but with the Germans in the area who, you know, thwarted their their whole operation, it made them open their eyes a bit and try to start, you know, fortifying some of the area around Les Moulins, Saint Laurent sur Mer, uh, or along the what they called the Golden Beach at the time, the Plage d'Or. Um so, an, like I say, an observation post was established. Now, the first things that would have been after Aquatint that the Germans added to 
this uh, strong point up here would have been these two um, Toe Brook mortars. Um, one second here. There we go. Uh, these two Toe Brook mortars right here. These two mortar Toe Brooks up here. Uh, LC-125 mortar Toe Brooks that were uh, that housed French uh, Brandt mortars. Um, let's see here. So uh, that was kind of the first real thing to this resistance nest from uh, besides that uh, observation post. And then as time went on, trenches were dug, uh, a sentry post and Velblech were added. Now a Velblech is a, is a uh, underground shelter uh, that's uh, basically sheet metal, corrugated sheet metal. Uh, you don't really see too much about them mentioned in books and such like that, but they are actually, they were actually pretty, uh, pretty common. Um, and they could do, they, they were kind of multi-purpose. They could house troops, they could store things and such like that. They were kind of almost known as like little garages that they could just, they could store things or, you know, use as shelters and such. Okay. So as the nest was expanded, uh, we had more shelter, uh, more, uh, trenches, uh, heading West. Uh, let's see here. One interesting thing to note here is that also there was a, uh, a, a small, um, Luftwaffe uh, ground unit that was stationed within this area right here, an observation unit at some point. Um, I kind of covered that a little bit in the previous mm -hmm. video, but um, yeah, this is where th this area right up here between these two brooks is seems to where seems to be where their observation position was at WN67. So farther west here, two enfilading machine gun positions were uh, dug. Now these, in terms of machine gun positions along Omaha. These are the main kinds of machine gun positions you're going to see. Machine gun yeah. pillboxes. They, they were these underground little pillboxes made of wood, metal, whatever they could find to make these. They, you know, cover them in dirt, connected to the trenches, and they were always set up in enfilading fire. Usually, one firing this way, one firing this way, never facing directly at the ocean, as we've, you know, we most people know by now. The Germans did all that enfilading fire stuff. And with these these tiny little pillbox machine gun pillboxes, you always see them facing either west or east. Now, this photo up here is of one. I, I can I've never found a great photo of these things. I've only been able to really spot them in reconnaissance photos. Um, this photo right here is the one at WN seventy one. As you can see, there's this big channel, this kind yeah. of V shaped channel that comes off of the embrasure right here. And uh, this would this one right here would have been facing west. <clears throat> so then, um, as we continue, a larger Veldbleck uh, shelter was built. This actually housed the troops of WN sixty seven on top of the uh, on top of the uh, escarpment here. As far as I can tell, this was also tenth uh, Company uh, seven twenty six reg uh, infantry regiment of the seven twenty seven sixteenth infantry division. And. Keep going right here. And then at the very rear, we have these two 1699 tow brooks, these two machine gun tow brooks guarding the rear of the nest. And you see this with nearly all WNs is that they have two tow brooks at the end guarding the rear. Because, I mean, even if there's an invasion, people come in, you know, from another point, they, they're they going to come around, and try to attack. So they did have uh, positions that would guard the rear of the nests. So uh, very in kind of interesting when it comes to that. Okay, um, and that's just a that's a blueprint of the uh, of one of the sixteen ninety nine tow brooks. That's not one at WN sixty seven. That's one uh, one of the nests at Colville sur Mer, but it is identical to the mm. ones that would have been at WN sixty seven. I mean, we should make it clear that this is probably the most modernized part of the beach now, where there's there's it's it's just houses and stuff, and it's 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 hard. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a. Uh, it, it th this we'll get into some of the construction here soon, but this area it's it's not the most it's not well documented, but in my opinion, it's one of the most interesting because it is just a hodgepodge of like construction and incomplete stuff. So very strange. Um, all right, let's keep going here. Okay, so we covered the eastern part of WN67. Now we're going to move to the west. So <clears throat> let's see here. Oh, one second. Okay. Uh, sorry, one moment. I mean, while you're just talking there, when you're comp composing your thoughts, so to speak, one of the interesting things, of the many interesting things about Omaha Beach is that it seems 
the upgrading of these the, the system that is happening in a completely random scattergun. It's not like they're looking at all the Vita stones and saying, let's upgrade this from this to this. It's it's like this one gets done, that one isn't being done. And I guess that's kind of a symbol of just where the Germans are with logistics, where they are with concrete, where they are with materials and workers. And it's, you know, we're now adding the knowledge that we know this is where the invasion came. But prior to the Germans knowing that, they're yes. dealing with this up and down hundreds of miles of coastline all I can only imagine that the, the Germans are in charge of, you know, concrete shipments and reinforcement are just being plagued with phone calls every day from people from, you know, Spain to Norway saying, where, where are our latest, whatever it is they need, bar wire pickets, uh, hmm. you know, it, it's, they're struggling. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, that's what I mean. It's a hodgepodge of things from guns to equipment. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So, um, as I was saying, throughout 1943, the nest was uh, expanded even further or farther uh, west. And uh, the thing about the this whole area on the western end of this uh, plateau was that you had these two big houses right here, uh, Les Costeles and uh, Pomade. Now, Les, Les Costeles is this one right here. There's a number of good photos of this one before the war. Unfortunately, there's not too many great photos of, the one, of Pomade. This is kind of one of the best photos that I was able uh -huh. to get cropped from a much larger photo but this pomard was actually um it was this grand house right here and it had a little guest house built into the uh the escarpment right here and it had a big stone wall that ran down the road that led to the house and all that and you can see that in my map right here but anyway so the germans obviously they wanted to expand this nest farther west and these two houses were in the way so they demolished them completely um pomard actually had a number of its uh basement and part of this guest house right here was still there but uh, Les Costeles was completely destroyed <clears throat> so let's see here come on okay so as they expanded the nest farther west we have a number of new uh, a number of new fortifications that were added R35 tur R35 turret from a Renault uh, tank was added uh, as a uh, what they call a uh, Panzer Dreturm uh, Tobruk with a tank actually fastened, a tank turret fastened to it. A lot of people, I think, who study Normandy kind of know those things are um, pretty ubiquitous. Um, but yeah, that's a Renault tank right there, you know, in 1940 during the Battle of France. And so you can see the turret on top there. They would take these and, you know, bam, add them to a Tobruk. Now, that one right there is the one at WN67. This is a photograph taken, you know, long after D Day probably sometime in June um, of the actual uh, Panzer Dreturm itself with the Renault turret on top, the R35 turret. And as you can see, what's kind of interesting is that you can tell the Germans took a bunch of tree branches and scattered them kind of around this thing as an attempt to camouflage it as best they could. And um, that's one thing also that's very interesting when you study uh, German resistance nests is just the um, what they would try to do to camouflage. It. And they would try to camouflage everything, obviously, but uh, you usually never see that in recreations but uh you know they would use tree branches nets concrete you know uh stones and such so it's just always interesting to see what they would use as camouflage um another feldmassig which is a uh you know a little underground uh could be used as a shelter uh was built and this one actually held the uh communications link to wn69 which was farther inland in w uh, in uh, saint laurent sur mer so that's kind of an interesting uh note with that one uh, and then at the rear here, now this is uh, this is uh, something that a lot of people will uh, probably find familiar. Um, covering the road that led to St. Laurent, an improvised double embrasure uh, machine gun pillbox was installed. Yeah. And this is, of course, very almost identical to the one that you can very much see today at uh, WN71 at Vierville. Um, but the main difference about this one is that it had a Tobruk on top. Now, see, there's the one at WN71. Yeah. But the one here, the ones here uh, within the Saint Laurent draw at Les Moulins um, that covered the Les Moulins draw, they had um, a Tobruk on top. Now, that's a photograph uh, after the battle. You can see right up in there. You can see that uh, machine gun pillbox. And... Uh, I think I cover the Tobruk in a little bit later. But uh, so here's a very interesting thing that um, I was able to uncover. And that is that within the ruins of uh, the Pomard house, 
uh, an enfilading underground bunker facing east contained a Mittler Verf, uh, Flammenwerfer 35 flamethrower. Um, this flamethrower had a capacity of 30 liters of fuel and uh, 10 liters of nitrogen and weighed about um, 120 uh, or 120 pounds or so. Uh, it projected a continuous uh, incandescent jet over 30 meters uh, for 25 seconds. This short range weapon uh, was also known as the skin snatcher. Uh, it's kind of a mm. menacing title, but um, it uh, it was obviously served by two men and it was transported on a small two wheeled cart, not like the uh, more familiar one that you see with the uh, straps on the, the yep. tanks on the back, but um, uh, kind of similar to the ones that they used in World War One, the very first flamethrowers where the guy would uh, wheel the tank out and the uh, yeah. operator yeah. would hold the hose. Um, but uh, these are just some photos of it. But one of these was found within the uh, ruins of this old underground pillbox there uh, by the people who wrote the Green Book, um, Elaine uh, Chazette, you know, yeah, him, yeah. him and his team. They found the actual they, within that when they did their excavation, they found the flamethrower in there. And that it, that's it right there. That's the actual one that was found within that cave. So uh, pretty interesting. But uh, this. And then they also found a bunch of cans of um, uh, fuel as well that were stored in there. These are the actual cans that were excavated. That's right there is the uh, western entrance of that underground bunker amongst the um, Pomard ruins. Uh, that is in the tunnel right there inside this underground bunker, this underground little pillbox where this flamethrower was found. They, they provided these photos to me, so I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Um this right here is, you can see this is concrete right here from the bunker, but this right here, these are parts of of, of the Pomard house that were yeah. left there. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's just interesting. That still remains. So, and then that's looking inside the tunnel. There's, there's this tunnel that went actually inside underneath the plateau for a little ways, but it eventually stopped. We don't know what they were planning on doing with it, but they were building some kind of underground tunnel that was perhaps going to lead to one of the... Um, one of the positions on top of the plateau. And we're oh. assuming it was never used. No, no, it wasn't. See, there's my little animation right there with that flame. This is what it would have been intended to be used. Like if any, if people were coming up here to attack this nest, this enfilading uh, pillbox right here would have shot this big jet of flame at them. It would have been a great uh, way to defend this place. But uh, from all accounts, I've never read anything that the Germans use this. Obviously, in all the aerial photos, I don't see any trace of smoke yeah, emitting yeah. from this area um, and uh, or you know, any accounts of it happening. But uh, it is interesting that with other German WNs along uh, Omaha, there are a lot of talks of flamethrowers and different flamethrowers that they were trying to use uh, for the WN. So the Germans did have flamethrowers as a concept for defending these positions but as far as i know they were never used it, it seems to me from my understanding is that there was from what i know a little bit of a, a distrust of how they worked arthur yanker who's the commander at peter this five at utah beach had automatic mm. flamethrowers and they were further up some and sometimes they didn't work but it seems from what i remember what are there an account with arthur Fitt, which book it was in where he was saying something we just didn't trust them we just didn't think them to work and the system was going to fail and more you know as much chance of doing the hurt to the user as it is the enemy so we just kind of relied on the other weapons which is probably just as well the last thing the allies need is is flame to deal with but the, you know scott grimber was commenting there he didn't know the germans had they definitely had them but it doesn't it didn't seem to be something they ever relied on um thank god no 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 yeah but it is uh and, and understandably i mean yeah that's not uh it, it's they're hard to control, you know, and they're, they also they're not one thing that people usually don't really think about with flamethrowers that they don't have they don't last very long, you know. They, yeah. they can shoot uh, uh, fire for about ten to fifteen seconds and then they're completely empty. So um, it's not like you know how movies depict it, where it's like just you know continuing to use it, continuing to use it. It's like it's usually used once and then it's thrown away. Um, so uh, yeah, just an interesting thing uh, that again, falls into what they would have been trying to use for these resistance nests, but never fully worked out. Now, we're going to the casemates of WN67. We covered all of the things that were on top of the plateaus, all the trenches and such. And um, an interesting thing to, to note with this is that at some point in, at, in early 1943, the Germans had realized that the placement of the resistance nests 
along the the beach, you know, WN66 down there, that was a bad idea. So they they realized that, well, why are we putting the nest down here on the beach when we have these big plateaus up there that have, you know, we have great range and all that stuff. So throughout 1943, you see the Germans taking the old positions that were along the beach, like WN66, and transporting most of that material back to stuff on the plateaus, like WN67. So you see at WN67, a lot of things from WN66 being brought back to be used up on the plateau. Now, the Germans, obviously, at WN67, they had their, uh, you know, all of their trenches dug, and they had a, a couple things like that uh, Panzer, or that uh, Renault turret up there, but they didn't have any major casemates yet at WN67. So what they wanted to do was build two large case, two enfilading casemates up here, basically where the Pomard and um, uh, Les Costeles house were. So casemates were planned. And this was also around the time that this anti-tank ditch was dug. This would have yep. been in late 43. So uh, a little little late to the game when it came to uh, building casemates for this uh, area. Um, and uh, according to... Uh, According to from what the documents I've seen, this was they, they planned these like in they, they started really building these in March of 44. But anyway, um, the customs house that we talked about in the previous video, this became the hub of construction for building these two casemates. So a lot of land was cleared. And uh, like I said, how WN66, a lot of the resources from that, instead of continuing to build up the stuff at WN66, take all that stuff and bring it back to WN67 because that is the important nest now. So you see this uh, railroad, uh, this railroad uh, built here that led from WN66 that, that reached uh, back up to where these casemates would be. And it ran along the old customs house here because this customs house was being used as, like I say, like a hub for the construction. They didn't, dis they didn't demolish that. Um, the first thing that they built was a uh, Beform 246. I, Sorry if I mess up that pronunciation, Tobruk uh, for a VK3001 turret. So just like how here on top of the escarpment, they have this uh, Tobruk for a R35 turret. They built a Tobruk for a VK3001 turret a bit farther down, um, right in front of the, right behind the anti-tank ditch filled with water. Now what that is, um, the, the, the actual uh, VK3001. So, uh, when the Germans were trying to come up with uh, the concept for the Tiger tank, a uh, number of different ideas were pitched and Henschel pitched the idea for this as their version of what would become the Tiger tank. And it's kind of almost like a souped up version of the Panzer IV. Um, so when it was built as a prototype, you know, it was called, it was designated as the VK3001. And um, the Germans passed on this. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't, accept this, but the prototypes that were built, you know, they had these prototypes. Hey, you know, we built them, we can use them for something. So a number of the turrets that were built uh, were sent to the Atlantic wall to be used as, as a, you know, Panzer threat term, you know, as a turrets to be mounted on tow brooks. Um, however, the turret itself that was meant for this specific tow brook was never finished. And it was actually, it was, it was in the area. It was on a couple of uh, railroad ties that were uh, left around the, uh, the old customs house. And that's it right there. Uh, a number of people call this thing a Panzer three or Panzer four turret. I've seen people call it that. It's not, it's actually a VK three zero zero one turret. It is not a tiger. It's not a Panzer four turret or a Panzer three turret. Um, but again, another very unique, interesting thing, you know, you don't, I think there were only four of these that were sent, uh, to the Atlantic wall and, uh, this, you know, here at, uh, Omaha, uh, a couple of them wound up there. So it's kind of interesting. And Niels is in the sidebar, you know, the speculation is this is post Aquatin, as you said, that this is, yes. got, there's, there's some things happened there. Let's strengthen this area where something has happened before, because we'd be stupid not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, from what I read, I, I did hear that this turret, I think it made it to, uh, it made it to the area at as late as like June 4th or June 5th. So it was like, it was a 44. So it was like, it was going to be installed right before D-Day. So interesting that it, got, it came that close. Um, so right behind the tow brook that was meant for the VK3001 turret, 
or that's another uh, photo, kind of grainy uh, cropped photo of it right there, sitting on a bunch of wood tie, mm. you know, railroad ties. And then that's the old customs house right there across. Well, the I'm road. nodding along, pretending I've seen these photos before. And I probably have seen the photos, but not <laughs> done what you've done, which is blow them up and been all geeky about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, Photoshop is a great tool when it comes to enhancing some of these things. So uh, I've cropped stuff. I've, uh, you know, zoomed in on things. So, yeah, it's a uh, very, uh, very nerdy. I love it. Um, all right. So in addition to that tow brook that was built there, the Germans had also built right behind that uh, that tow brook for that turret, a ring stand for a KWK 38 gun. Um, now, one second here. Um, let's see here. Uh, right behind the tow brook. Yeah. OK. Uh, what's interesting is that this there's a, a blueprint of it. Um, whoops is that this was kind of similar to the uh, the one at the, uh, the ring stand for the KWK-38 at WN-66, although it had this enfilading protective wall right here. Um, a bit more of an improvised version of the ring stand uh, 16, uh, uh, 1694, which is the one here at, uh, at WN-66. There it is right there. We covered it in the previous video. And how I was saying earlier that the a lot of the resources for these positions along the beach were being brought back to the plateaus. Um, what they did a lot too, is they, you know, take guns out of old positions that were established on the beach and bring them back to ones that were being built on the escarpment. So my belief is that the KWK 31 that was at WN 66 was intended to be brought back for this specific mm -hmm. position, this specific ring stand here, um, you know, up by the customs house, but it, it just never happened. So there it is right there. This is the only real photograph I've been able to find of it. Um, as you can see there, right down there, there's the, the tow brook for the, uh, the VK3001 turret, you know, unfinished completely. Yep, there's yep. nothing on it. And then this right here is that ring stand. And uh, it's my belief that, that the KWK38 at WN66 was going to be brought back to be installed at this position. Wow. And that and that maybe suggests, I know we are not doing Vidas Nonza 61. We might do that in the future. Yeah. When I stand there, I'm always, why the fuck did they put those bunkers just off the, the shore when you've got a perfectly good bluff up right. there behind you? So they thought the know, same one thing. can only assume that had D-Day not happened, that this this idea would have spread down, they, that they would have started moving other, you know, shuffling it around. I mean, they shuffled their pack in numerous places. Maisie has stages of development. Merville, which I know they're, they're gun batches, but I think a lot of people had this idea the Germans built stuff and that was it. And they were always upgrading. They were always, no. um, well, not always, but some places they were upgrading and changing because it's a, the system is changing, but different sized bombs are being dropped. They're having experience of what the allies are doing at torch and Husky and avalanche. Yeah. And, and, and ideas are being spread around and this did work. This didn't work. And you know, it's, it's that I, if we are, if we were to cover up all these positions, and then rediscover them again because you find, let's say you find 10 emplacements of Vida Snodge. It doesn't mean there were 10 weapons there. It means 10 different installations for weapons were yep. built over a period of months, stroke years. And, and you might be looking at three positions that actually held the same gun in different eras. I mean, that applies to Mervyn and places like that. So it's, well, it's, it's cool to make sure that you understand viewers that the germans are in in flux they're 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 adapting and moving as best they can with their own limited resources absolutely and we'll get we're, there's still more to come paul when it comes to uh things that were moved around in this area yeah. so yeah, yeah we'll yeah. get in, even more into it but uh, as you can it's funny it's in this photo right here you can see someone wrote message center so that was something that you know obviously post d days there was you know a center over here that they, <laughs> the americans wrote that on there but um but that that is true is that when the, the nests were first established, you know, uh, in 42, they were down on the beaches. Most of them were yeah. anyway. However, at some point, someone like with your mindset said, why the fuck is this the case? Bring them back, you, you idiots. And so throughout 42, 43 and early 44, um, you see that where things are being taken from the beach and brought back. And then yeah. just little remnants along the beach uh, exists by detail. We've got David O'Keefe and other Canadians watching this, you know, and the, we, we talk about the supposed learning the Allies did from Dieppe, but folks, let Dieppe was much more complicated than they're trying to learn stuff. But the point is that process was being done by the Germans. The Germans learned shit at Dieppe as well. They learned yeah. 
which bunkers weren't working, which ones were the ones, and which ones could be overrun quickly. So, so they're looking at it and going, okay, well, this has taught us this. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's yeah. one of the uh, one of the places where actually you see the Schnabel stand uh, being used, which is the, the famous German bunker that's featured in Saving Private Ryan. Dieppe, they had a couple of those. And by that point, that was being phased out as the uh, the type of bunker to use as a machine gun position. But at that point, I think that was one of the things that made them realize that no, we, we need to use things like tow brooks for machine guns rather than this big, you know, observation deck. Um, so just kind of an interesting side note there. But, uh, let's see, going back here. All right. So these two positions right here, the uh, tow brook for the turret and then this uh, ring stand for the KWK 38 gun were meant uh, as additional support for the two giant casemates that were planned to be built here. Um Officially, they, apparently they were begun in March of 1944, uh, so they were never completely finished. But on the uh, western side, we had an R612 uh, casemate for a FKM-17 gun, those Czechoslovakian 75-millimeter uh, guns. And then on the on the east, we have an R677 for a Pac-4143 88-millimeter gun, which you see at um, WN-72 at Viraville, and then you see another one at WN-60 at Colville-sur-Mer. So one of these was being planned to be built here. Um, from what I was able to fi to figure out, um, I think the, the FK M-17 gun was somewhere on the plateau. It was found by the Americans on D-Day. When they found it, the Germans had sabotaged it themselves, so it couldn't be used again. And then the uh, the PAC-4143 was later found at some ammo or, or you know depot of some sort um farther inland uh i have to do further research on that to really pinpoint it it's featured more in the green book which uh, i saw someone ask what what the book is called this is the book it's just called it atlantic wall omaha beach and uh by us omaha nerds we refer to it as the green book but uh yeah by elaine chisette and um Grab yourself a copy if you can. It's a little, it's kind of rare, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, you can buy it direct from the website. And it's, it's, it, the main captions are translated into English, but not the text. So you, 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 isn't it? Is that right? It's, it's that's not right. All yeah. In English. yeah. It's, it's got, well, it, a lot of the, I translated the whole thing myself, but, uh, uh <laughs> shut up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, uh, it, it does have like the little descriptions for the photos. It has both French and English versions of those, but uh, the actual descriptions themselves are uh, all in French. So if you want to be a super nerd like us, uh, yeah, you got to translate it yourself. Deeple uh, is your friend. Deeple.com. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, these, like a lot of these German nests, they were made to fire both East and West, not straight at the ocean. You know, that's what a coastal battery is for, but the actual WNs, they would always do this where they would face uh, do enfilading fire. Now, like, as I say, construction on these were begun in March of uh, 1944. And uh, the, uh, the two casemates, this is all that was done of them. They were just some walls were built. You have a rebar skeleton in there. And uh, that was pretty much it. These were never complete, never even close. They didn't have guns in them or anything. So this uh, right here, this photo is obviously after D-Day shows a bit of the construction site. There is the old customs house right there. And then there's part of the R677 that was being built. The R612 was somewhere behind here. Um, that right there is the R612, uh, the remnants of it. You see a lot of wood false work over here. Uh, rebar skeleton inside, obviously. A lot of the uh, concrete blocks that were being used. And this is, again, as we've talked about, Paul, it's uh, it's not the uh, you know complete poured concrete. It's uh, concrete blocks uh, yeah. being stacked up, and you know more like just brick and mortar, not necessarily uh, you know uh, poured concrete. Uh, and we'll have to talk about it again. I mean, and I'm going going down a rabbit hole, but you know further up uh, between um, 62 and 64 mm -hmm. is where there's the the monument these days to the medics part of 16th Infantry. But that was part of the concrete mount the Germans built. We may have talked about this on a previous one. I can't remember for the drag that the Germans were dragging sand off the beach, like yep. you know, like like a like a the the, the, the drag thing they use at the end of um, Get Carter with Michael Caine made in seventy two, <laughs> that kind of thing. But that was for coal, and this is for sand. And the Germans and and the people who who any, know anything about construction will just have their minds blown by this. The Germans are having such problems getting sand from places where you the industrial sand comes from to the coast because of the bombing of the the transport plan the trail. They're actually trying to get sand off the beaches 
dry it out in the sun, wash the salt out of it, and use beach sand for construction. And it's just, A, it takes a long time. B, you've got to dry the shit out. You've got to get the salt out because if you leave the salt in it and you put rebar in it, you make it. And that, folks, is how the Germans are considering using sand uh, to make cement in 44. They're this yep. this much-vaunted German Atlantic wall that they've been putting in the front of all their magazines, kind of trying to outdo the Maginot line. By 44, they're so screwed because their own inability to move stuff they're trying to get sand off the beach and dry it out it's crazy i mean it's just stupid Ab absolutely but i mean desperate times right you know yeah. it's like it's whatever you can whatever you can do um so the, absolutely it's, it's just it's crazy but uh this right here is a construction of the r6 um r677 a member of the esb in there uh checking things out but uh yeah rebar skeleton nothing was not even close to being done so uh, uh i hope your channel doesn't get struck for nudity but uh yeah there's one of the gi's taking a shower inside there <laughs> um so uh, that's wn67 so that's the the uh, barbed wire pattern there of uh what they yeah. would have had they did have a, quite a bit of barbed wire that uh covered the whole thing so it was a pretty big nest but like i say also very incomplete and very um you know thrown together in a lot of ways um so it's interesting though, if I can go back for a second, get you know, not that, but uh the uh this whole thing right here, the close proximity of the tow brook, the ring stand, the casemate, uh, is perplexing to me since uh these would have been prime targets for naval artillery fire, in my opinion. Like if if that was the case, you know, if it was optional. Um the placement of the casemates on the slope also just made it difficult to link them to the rear trenches atop the plateau. So uh seems like to remedy this maybe that underground tunnel was trying to be used as a way with the flamethrower to maybe link these i don't know but you know a lot of speculation of what could have been if this was if we ever saw this in its finished state yeah i mean who knows the germans might have pushed up mounds of earth around it over it you know yeah um but it's interesting what they were doing again it comes is that they don't seem to have an overall plan for this there isn't some kind of um San Lorenzo Mayor Führer, who's gone there and looked at this with a big map and said, what we need to do is this, this, this. It's all being done by individuals kind of doing it in a very kind of penny packet kind of, we'll do this one this week because we've got a few bags of cement, as opposed to some coordinated effort. Thank, again, thank God they didn't put some coordinated effort into this and 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 bring in thousands of construction teams and do it, you know, but they, it was this weird kind of, we've got a few, we've got a few days, days lads, should we do this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess so. You know, so just weird. And then uh, so that's my map, you know, explaining all the process of each position uh, at WN67. And, and as I did. I kind of forgot to cover it. But as this stuff, you know, unfolded over here, that observation post uh, that was built in response to Aquatint yep. was um, dismantled and torn apart for things to be used over here. So right. uh, we kind of covered that in the previous video, but that was part of 67. So there is WN67 uh, from an aerial photograph taken on May 31st to 44. And then there is WN67 on D-Day itself taken around noon. So uh, pretty interesting. And uh, in my painting that I showed in the previous uh, episode of uh, the Le Cible Doll House at WN66, I did put elements of WN67 in the background here. So I just wanted to show that for a second, a little my artistic interpretation. There's the uh, ring stand right there yeah. the with the it's enfilading wall. There's the line for the tow brook. And there's the BK3001 turret sitting on its planks up there next to the old customs house and a whole bunch of... Uh, construction french construction workers uh working on it uh a lot of this was inspired by uh peter bruegel's tower of babel if you're familiar with that with its mm. microscopic workers everywhere but um so yeah that was as far as my artistic interpretation that was all i could do for that painting of wn67 with just the a random complete story because i'm in a good mood it's saturday night in duva de Livron, in a radar station uh, museum there's a there's a model of one of the um radar bunkers being built 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 and they've used whatever kit 132 scale german figures workers to do but they obviously 
put them in, and the, the glue wobbled, so they're all leaning over. So <laughs> they're all Great. completely drunk. <laughs> they're just like pissed up workers there. Not one of them is standing up. So there's, like, there's a guy like a wheelbarrow, like leaning over at an angle. It's hilarious. <laughs> I can't, all I can see when I see this is the pissed workers doing it. That's pissed UK, <laughs> meaning drunk, not pissed as angry. Right. And, and I, every time I see it, it's like, someone just needs to go back to the model, go cut them off there, get the glue and stand them up properly. But no, they're all, they're all at an angle. It's funny. Uh, someone it, people don't care enough to maintain that, I guess. I would if I worked there, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if I, if I worked there, I'd probably make it more accurate too. But uh, let's see here. So we covered WN67, and uh, now we're gonna move to the western side of Le Moulin mm. and cover WN68. Now, as you can see, this is actually broken in two, and we'll get into that as we go. So, the nest that would become WN62. Uh, or sorry, not WN62, WN68 was conceived in the summer of 1942 when it was known as WN29C, you know, as part of uh, Stuck Point 29, as it was first uh, called. And just like WN66, it was directly behind the shingle embankment on the beach. And now the first prominent bit of firepower at the nest, let's see, there's Villa St. Cecil right there. Whoops. That was uh, kind of the heart of uh, WN29C, mm -hmm. as we'll call it right now, was this house right here, St. Saint Ce Saint Cecil. Um, the first uh, prominent thing at WN29C uh, was this APX anti-tank gun, a French anti-tank gun that the Germans were using. And um, this is what they would have been using uh, to shoot at the, Brit the British commandos uh, uh, during the Aquatent incident. You know, they describe uh, in the documents that there was an anti-tank gun on the beach um, right in front, you know, right there at Les Moulin that was sh that shot at the Goatly yeah. boat and at the, uh, the boat that was transporting them. And so this is what it would have been, was the APX uh, anti-tank gun, captured French gun that the Germans designated the, uh, the Pac-181. So uh, throughout 1943, uh, it, it started to be expanded. More trenches were dug, uh, more positions were, were uh, you know, were established, more things were built along the beach here. And that's when it became WN-68. That's when they changed it from WN-29C to WN-68. Um, one of the first things that they did was build a nut just like WN-60. There's so many similar similarities between... WN68 and WN66 and 67. So you're going to see a lot of like mirroring when it comes to that. Um, so one of the first things they built was a 1694 ring stand right at the intersection um, of the road that ran along the coast uh, to the road that, that led to St. Laurent. Um, now this specific one here, uh, unlike the one at WN66, this one was built in a rush like we talked about with the sand concrete and all that. And it just never seemed to be able to work to to work properly. I don't think a KWK 38 gun was ever installed there. I can't find evidence of one. So when you look at aerial photographs of this thing, it's just kind of a base of concrete. It doesn't even have any walls in it. So at some point in 43, the Germans said, well, screw that. We're not going to deal with that anymore. We'll build one a bit farther inland. That's not so close to the waves and such like that. So they built a second uh, 1694 ring stand. Um, but this was never completed as well. Uh, never seemed to have a, a KWK 38 gun in it. And all it seemed to do was serve as a platform for the APX anti-tank gun that was there in 42. Um, if you look at aerial photographs of it, you can see that the walls, uh, it's walls facing east are taken out. And it's probably so they could get that gun in there. Um so munition sablage uh was added, and this was to um you know, store ammo for these two anti-tank guns at the uh, for these ring stands here. Uh, munition sablage, it's just basically like a little concrete compartment. Uh, this one right here, it's not, uh, that's not the one at WN68. This is one somewhere else that I was able to find, but it is the type that would have been there. It's, it's similar to what you would have seen. Um, so... Moving up to the trench here, a trench was dug along the uh, right, be right behind the uh, mm -hmm. shingle here. Again, just like WN66 and just like at WN66, a machine gun Tobruk was added. Uh, Tobruk 58C for a machine gun here. And that's a uh, blueprint of it. And then that's, again, this is not this is not the one that's at WN68, but it's one that would have been like it. So yeah. it's, it's the exact layout of the one that would have been there. 
So, and then the, that's just an example of some of them being used. What's interesting is that some of them, they did, I don't forgot what the name of this was, but some of them did have these mounts with these shields on them to, you know, instead of just mounting the uh, tripod along the edge of the tow brook, some of them did have these, sh these uh, mounts where they could put a shield up. So kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, several other fighting positions along the trench were established. Two of those U-shaped uh, positions that we've talked about in yeah. previous episodes. And then one here at the back where the uh, the ammunition for this trench was stored, you know, for the machine guns and for uh, any anyone with rifles. Um, so, again, these are not photographs of WN-68, but these are photographs, just of examples showing what trenches dug along uh, the beaches would have been like. So uh, we already we had that one in the previous episode there. Um, there is, again, that photograph showing what that U-shaped uh, position would have how that would have been utilized. Um, all right. So throughout 1943, much of Les Moulins was demolished, as we talked about in the previous episode. So a lot of these houses around here were demolished, but St. Cecil still remained, uh, likely just like uh, Le Cèbre Loudon at um, WN-66. This one was uh, left at WN-68 to uh, house a lot of the troops and kind of act as, you know, a garrison for them. Again, there is a there's a St. Cecil before the war. There's St. Cecil during the war. This photograph was taken in 43. These are troops um, who would have been her training on a uh, WZ-30 machine gun. And uh, a lot of these guys uh, ended up at WN-62, actually. I'm not going to get into who is who here, but uh, when we do WN-62, we can cover that. Mm. Um, so there's St. Cecil uh, taken on May 19th, 1944 in a reconnaissance photo. It's about as close to D-Day as you can get. Um, at WN68 down here on the beach, uh, according to a report from June 15th of 1943, 12 soldiers from the 10th company of Grenadier Regiment 726, uh, occupied the nest. Um, obviously that probably changed, uh, when, you know, a year later when D-Day was happening, but, um, three, the, the 12 soldiers out of the 12 soldiers, there were three ma uh, machine gun teams. So that's nine soldiers on, uh, you know, that made up the machine gun teams. Um, one MG and each team had a different machine gun, one MG 34, one MG 30, and then one Mac 31 French machine gun. Uh, so just interesting that, uh, we were talking earlier about different gun, you know, different things had different types of guns. So this is a good example of that, where these three machine guns would have been used at, uh, the, this trench along here with these three positions and each yeah. one would have been a different type. And we had the question, uh, from, Peter O'Connell there is how on earth did German quartermasters figure out where to find and how to distribute all the various ammunition type and spare parts for a crazy collection of disparate weapons they depended on. Yes, it was mm -hmm. a massive great problem. In Vida Stondo 73, folks, the, well, that you now can't get into the mortar positions very well any of these days. It's all overgrown. But when you could, in one of the um, the, the side rooms off by the, uh, the the mortar positions, there's a, you can still see it. I've got a photo somewhere. I'll try and find it maybe later. There's a German written pencil in pencil order. Yep. It's like a, it's like they're they're allocating all the different boxes to this room, and there's like about twenty five different notes of two thousand rounds of this and sixteen rounds of this, and it's all in. You can barely read it, but it was obviously a nightmare. It's like you know, basically in American army, lots of thirty cal. That's and that pretty much covers a hell of a lot of stuff: tank guns, infantry guns, you know. Rifles, BARs, um, German stuff. As you were talking, you know, it's it's all the different stuff. Then there's tracer for the machine gun. Then there's the spare parts. Then there's the manuals. I mean, Niels is on the sidebar. You know, the Germans printed their pay documentation in Normandy in about a dozen different languages because of all the you know the poles and the checks and everybody else that were there and these spare parts. And do they have spare parts? I mean, that's essentially, folks, one of the reasons why the Atlantic Wall doesn't function as well as it should. It's just too many different separate component parts it's not streamlined it's not efficient it's um they built big stuff out of concrete but the 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 infrastructure just failed yeah and and uh it, it's it's funny yeah because we're talking about mixing these weapons and such i mean um you know like uh talking about these guns right here like obviously the mg34 and the mg30 that were there you know, they would have fired um, Mauser ammunition, you know, yeah. uh, what we in the United States usually call eight millimeter Mauser. Um, however, like the Mac 31, you know, that would have fired 7.5 Moss. So yeah. it's like trying to get like, OK, mixing that all up together. Like, OK, we got eight millimeter Mauser, but then, you know, um, 7.5 Moss. It's just like 
uh, you know, what, what is, what is the deal here? So um, always interesting to, to. Yeah. Neil's just saying, of course, quartermaster point, you only have to stock a position once. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you want to train with the weapons, you're going to have to, you want to, you want to use ammunition. And that's what, you know, that's another separate subject of the day is exactly how much time these Germans had had using these weapons and doing them. Hence the, this discussion, in the previous show about the MG 34s on the, on the, uh, the barrels of the, uh, the, the, the pack 43s, you know, that they, mm -hmm. they aren't, they haven't got ammunition to waste every day on let's fire a few rounds down the beach out of our French machine gun and use it. They, they having to, it's all a lot of it's done by theory. They know what the guns can do. They've got ammunition stock stockpile, but they haven't actually had much practical application of what to do when the weapon jams, what to do when this that's that's they're gonna have to work that out when the day happens. Yeah, just figure it out on the spot how to maintain this this stupid thing. Yeah. Well whereas, whereas you know the, the allies are theoretically before D Day, all the assault you know units have been <laughs> through training repeatedly. They they can they've got muscle memory for most of their the things they have to do with loading and reloading and stripping and cleaning. Yeah, we got 30 out six and 45. That's all we need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 30 uh, 30 caliber for carbines as well. But uh anyway, so um in early 44, when the Germans realized that, you know, elements of WN-66 need to be used at WN-67 up on the plateau, just like what we talked about, they uh, did the exact same thing for WN-68. They were like, hey, yeah, screw this whole stuff on the beach. Move it back to that plateau that's way up there. Um, however, instead of designating a new uh, a new post, um, like, at w like how WN-66, then you had WN-67 up there. The Germans just decided to split WN-68 in two, and they decided to leave WN-68B on the beach and then establish WN-68A up on the plateau. So still kind of have the two be the same nest, but split in half. Um, around this time as well, that uh, an excavator had dug that huge anti-tank ditch, you know, that you can really see in aerial photographs. So that was, uh, you know, a big factor. And... Uh, the house, uh, or excuse me. Yeah, the house uh, right under the plateau of WN-68 uh, Rode was left. Uh, it wasn't demolished like many of the other houses uh, at Les Moulins. And that, just like how the customs house became the hub for construction, this house right here became the hub for construction at WN-68. So a lot of things were demolished here, or, or a lot of things were cleared here for um, construction to begin. There's the Royd house. There, there's the Roy House uh, uh, in the uh, May May 19th uh, reconnaissance uh, photo, and then there it is after after the war in 1945. So it did, uh, you know, it, it held up. It was not destroyed. Uh, surprisingly, you know, it, it survived the uh, German destruction of the of Les Moulins, and it survived D Day. So pretty pretty cool. It's not there today, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I don't know when it was necessarily destroyed. So. Up on the uh, again, this is kind of mirroring a lot of what you see at WN67. Up on the uh, escarpment on that plateau, you have a big um, semicircle uh, line of trenches here uh, with various um, positions attached to it. So, a line of trenches were dug, three positions for enfilading machine uh, enfilading machine guns for MG34s and MG30s uh, were dug, um, made from you know, scavenged, scavenged rubble from uh, different houses and such like that. And uh, just like how we talked about WN67, they were built with that enfilading design where you have two embrasures facing, you know, e uh, west and then one facing east. So, but this one had an abundance of them. And you can see there's their, uh, there's their field of fire right there. And uh, in this photo, this is again, the uh, recon photo from May 19th. These are the positions right here. The, the, the pillboxes and they would, you know, mm -hmm. have a little area cleared for their field of fire in order to shoot, you know. And again, that's an ex that's that same one from WN seventy one. Just an example yep. to show you what they would have looked like. Okay, come on now. So down here uh, on the on the on the um, more with more within the uh, the ravine of the of the nest, we had a Veldbleck. Uh, installed again that uh sheet metal kind of garage underground and that actually stored the uh, apx anti-tank gun that was on the beach earlier so at one you know that was used in 42 on the beach it was kind of moved to another position uh at wn68 
And then once WN68A became a thing, they moved that thing all the way back and stored it within the Veldblik uh, that was at the plateau. So that's where that ended up. And um, again, just like at WN67, you have one of those uh, double embrasure pillboxes that's covering the uh, the road that led to Saint Laurent, and it it basically mirrors the one that's at WN67. And both of these are very similar to the two that are at the Viraville uh, draw. Yeah. So clearly, the uh, the tenth company was you know of uh, Grenadier Regiment Seven Two Six was they were in contact with whoever was or the two the two people at both you know Viraville and Saint Laurent. They were talking to each other in terms of how to uh, defend these roads because they're very similar designs. And I don't, I don't recall any other spot where I've seen pillboxes like this with these two, like these kind of L shaped, you know, pillboxes with two firing ports like that. Um, there's, there's, there's one on at least one on gold somewhere in not, but again, not, not right on the beach. It's just inland. I forget which reader stand this is. I would, I would have to go, but that there, I'm pretty sure there's one there. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, they're rare. They're rare. Yeah. Okay. So, and gold that would have been covered by the seven sixteenth infantry division as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, clearly within the seven sixteenth. Yeah, know, it's it, yeah, it's the um the the west side of gold which comes under the same um, right. Yeah. Unit. Because so, yeah. uh, these aren't they're not regal bow. You know, they're clear. They're not designed by organization tote or anything. So, I believe these were just you know built by the soldiers. You know, who are there. Um, or, you know, the soldiers hired construction crews or such. So that's the photo of it today with it, all of the weeds cleared away from it. Usually you see this thing buried in vegetation and such, but someone finally cleared it up. So they get it. Yeah, the, the, the new owners have cleared it all off, but there, there's a fence 25 oh, feet, really? meters in front of it. So you can't get very close. I've never thought, I mean, I'm going to walk my tour group past there next week, but I, I, I've not investigated whether or not they'd let people in but there's a proper wooden fence in where that whoever was took that photo is just where that photo was taken so mm. i'm glad they've cleared it off but they they could have put the fence a bit closer or they you know i don't know but maybe if i knocked on a door and going did they let they let me crawl inside i have no idea what what it's <laughs> like to see um don't worry someday yeah. we'll break we'll break into all these places paul yeah so. we'll, we'll go in there the nin ninja gear yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll just go and see it all <laughs> so uh this is actually inside that specific one. So, uh, and uh, as we can see at the uh, embrasures here, we have these uh, imprints with these bolts, and these are meant for um, 48p, 48p8 uh, steel uh, embrasure doors right here that were would have been fitted to these before. So you could actually close up these embrasures. <clears throat> they weren't just, um, they didn't used to just be, let's see. They didn't used to just be open like that. They would have had steel doors that would have, you could mount the machine gun here and then you could open these doors so you could open and close them uh, when when needed. And just for people to know, P Peter is asking, you know, people own these bunkers. I mean, technically they don't, they own the ground the bunkers sit on is more right. kind of the legal, is that the, the, these, you've got to understand folks, that some of these areas behind Omaha Beach have been owned by the same family for years before the war and still today. Yeah. I, I don't think this one is. And so, if the Germans happen to build a build a bunker on your property and you come back to your property, that bunker becomes yours. They're, they're, some of the bunkers are on on state owned dunes. Some are part of museums. Some are kind of owned by the town, and some are on private property because that's someone's property. There's a there's a whole variety of of um of of ownership issues with regards bunkers. And one of the questions we get, we're going down a rabbit hole, but who cares? It's Saturday is, you know, is there been <laughs> any effort made to preserve these and are they going to be preserving these things? Well, sometimes in a museum, they are being actively preserved. And then sometimes they're not, they're falling apart. There's graffiti on some, some are subsiding. One fell off uh, uh, the cliff at, um, a gone caught Maisie earlier this year. One of the Tobruks fell off the cliff. Um, and it, that's happening at near Dieppe as well. So, there is no active effort to officially preserve these things in France or anywhere else in 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 Europe. Yeah. And if people say, "Why not?" and the answer is because there's lots of more important things to spend money on. And I'm saying that as someone who likes World War II history, but I also would like to have you know healthcare and better roads and, and education. And I don't, I wouldn't want to see a a government come in and say, "We're well, yeah, we're going to spend three million three billion dollars reinforcing the old Nazi shit they built eighty years ago." Um, yeah, there's at better this, ways to spend the money at this point. It's become part of nature. You know, yeah. that's that's how I see it. You know, it's it belongs to the land. 
it's you can study it still. Um, but I I've always kind of kind of I always do find it a little strange when I see stuff like that. Why don't they, you know, uh why don't they renovate them? Why don't they build them? It's like, well, because it's it's a tool for war. Like it's it's yeah, not no, yeah. It's, well, well, <laughs> as you've mentioned that, Mark, and one of the things I know will get people uh, upset on Twitter is if I when I'm out with Mag and I see a bunker and I take a photo of one I've not seen before somewhere in Brittany or something, mm -hmm. and it's got graffiti on it, I put it on Twitter and said, "Oh, just walk past the bunker." I count, I count on weight. And within a few seconds, someone say, "Oh, it's a pity put graf people put graffiti on them." I think yeah. that's a real shame. Um, they should be left in their original state. To which my 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 ready to go reply is: "By original state, do you mean with the German minefields, the machine guns, and the German troops inside them? Is that what? Because that's the original state." And they go, "No, no, I don't mean that original state." I say, "Well, there, there we are then. You know, they're, they're, oh, the French have them now. The Belgians have them. Belgians have them now. The Danes have them now. The Norwegians have them. If they want to paint them." Who cares? They are, they yeah. are, they are. I, I wouldn't paint, I wouldn't put graffiti on a bunker, but I don't care if someone else does. The Germans built them without the Europeans' permission. They are part of the European landscape. And if, if the French want to let them rot or fall off or put graffiti on them, I'm fine with it. It's their decision. Absolutely. Like, you know, I say it's, it's part of nature now. And uh, I, uh, no, I, I see that all the time too. People say, oh, this is sacred ground. You know what? And it's like, I don't know people have this, um, they have this, this, they, they, they treat history sometimes like it's mythology, you know, yeah. they, they, they love the, uh, the aesthetic of everything. They want to see it, you know, and it's like, well, no, this is, this is stuff that was used for war, you know, and it's like, it's good that it is no longer in use. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, folks, just to balance it, and I'll let back to Michael and his bunkers is that yes, there's graffiti on German bunkers and every now and then a memorial to World War II gets vandalized, but it's very rare. Or often it's because a truck reverses into one of the, one of the, um, the Liberty Highway markers at Utah Beach. A truck reversed into it last year or the year before. It wasn't it wasn't deliberate. It just it backed up too much. But th there's a huge respect for the monuments to where Allied soldiers fell. And that is, if people want to judge the French for putting graffiti on German bunkers, they can. But don't think the French are going out there putting graffiti on monuments to the Americans, because that is very, very rare. Uh, very, very, I mean, I've known of like three incidents ever in my living in Normandy. It's just something that doesn't happen. There's huge respect. The flags go up at the monuments. There's massive respect for the allies, for Brad watching this, for Juno beach. But yes, occasionally a bunker gets someone. There's, there's one in, in, in Ile de Ray where they filled, um, filmed, um, longest day with a, uh, uh, Frankenstein's monster, Boris Karloff has Frankenstein's monster on it. And I, I have no problem. There's another one, where they, because it's a long bunk with like an anti-tank wall, it's a crocodile painting. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. And you could also argue, folks, then I'll let go back to Michael, is that putting a layer of paint on it is actually helping preserve it, not, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's putting a kind of a waterproof acrylic oil coating on it. So, so yeah, people say people are surprised to see artistic expression on bunkers, but I personally have no problem in it. Now, JD, he's the underground, he doesn't like the graffiti, but we, you know, we agree to disagree on this. It's just, you know, it's. Uh, I know he. He and I have talked about that too. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, we're going down. I'll get it back to you. Sorry, I was, I'm, all, I'm all off good. the soapbox now. We, we uh, do. I can do it too. So it's all good, and I do it a lot sometimes. But uh, so this right here, just going back to the double embrasure pillboxes right here. This is a an example of what that configuration with those uh 48 P8 steel doors uh, would have been like with the machine gun mounted. Now, um, this is more of a storage uh, type thing, what they're doing here. Um, if you were actually going to use this, you would mount it on the center pivot of the machine gun right here um, because you want to keep your ears. There's no way you want that muzzle going off when it's inside the bunker. <laughs> so uh, just, uh, just, just wanted to clarify that. Yep. Yep. Um, and then this is some more photos taken inside the uh, the double um, uh, double machine gun embrasure at WN sixty eight A. Now that we're, we're referring to is that that's the tow brook. The, the interesting thing about these two uh, that's different about these two um, the two that at uh, Les Moulins is that they had these tow brooks on top. So kind of interesting, probably for observation. I don't think anything was like mounted on these, or these were meant for mm -hmm. machine gun use or anything. These were probably just for observation, and they would probably seal them up if uh, battle was going on. Um, okay, keep going. So in my painting, uh, that we covered in the last episode, just like how we did, how I showed that, you know, WN 67 in the background, also on the right side of the painting, I put a little bit of WN 68 because that's what you would have seen. So this right here, obviously that's the double embrasure pillbox right yep. there. That's one of those improvised, uh, underground machine gun pillboxes. And then that's one of the trenches that led to the Velbleck down there. Uh, 
so going. Okay, so just like at WN67, how right below the plateau uh, on the side facing the ocean, they wanted to put some more reinforced, uh, you know, heavy uh, stuff in there, you know, st some uh, some anti-tank weapons and some pillboxes and such. So one of the things that they added was a VK3001 turret on a uh, Buform 246 uh, Tobruk, just like at WN67. However, unlike WN67, this one actually was complete. This one actually was mounted on the mm -hmm. Tobruk. And this is a uh, schematic right here, a little blueprint showing the um, what the uh, Buform 246 Tobruk is like with the turret mounted on it. And uh, here you have the, the racks for the ammunition. And then here's where the turret would be. Um, now this one, I, I, uh, I didn't mention it before, but this is a photo. Th the photos of this one are very well known. You see these a lot online. Um, obviously they're very, you know, very striking photos and such. And this is where I always see them being mentioned. They're always being called Panzer three or Panzer four turrets. Again, it's not a Panzer four turret. It's a unique, it's a prototype turret for a, for the VK3001 tank project that was canceled. So yeah, I see that mentioned a lot. And, um, there's my colorization of it. I colored, mm -hmm. I did a colorization myself. I'm not the best colorization guy, but uh, I thought I'd take a stab at it with that one. Pretty damn cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, and so here's some more photos of it. Uh, there are there are a number of photos of this thing. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's very interesting. There it is. You know, GIs around it. There's a uh, Roy Day. You know, right there. This this all up here is added by the Americans. All this uh, netting and such. Um. And then here's a photo where you see the good shot of the Roy Day house. There's the VK3001 turret. And then if you look over here off to the right, you have what looks to be a, um, a Renault turret for, or a, um, what do they call it? FT17 uh, yeah. turret. And uh, which there was. And what's, what's kind of cool is that uh, right behind the VK3001 turret, they may, they were going to put, a uh, FT-17 or FT-MG-3311 turret, you know, made for a machine gun, not uh, not a not like a cannon, um, on a tow brook that was built uh, a little bit behind it, right in front of the road. So this is what this would have been like, and it would have had a Mac-31 machine gun installed in it. However, like many things in this area, it was never finished, and the turret just sat right next to the VK-3001, like you saw in that photo. Uh, waiting to be installed, and it never was. Um, so one of the things that was being built also, th this was, you know, very, very in the early stages, was an R677. Um, or sorry, I, I got this wrong right here. Actually, I meant R667. R667 was the type of casemate that houses the uh, KWK38, which is what one of the most uh, famous bunkers that's at WN65 today, one of the remaining yeah. ones. And one of these was being planned to be built right here, uh, right below the plateau. And the only thing that they got done on it was uh, some of the rebar skeleton. And that's it. There's no real progress that was made on it. However, this was also mirroring what was being done over at WN67 with those two enfilading pillboxes or, or uh, casemates. So I believe that at some point they would have also built some other kind of casemate over here covering the western part so they could have that double enfilading fire like they were trying to do at WN67. Um, this photo right here taken after D-Day, this is the only photo I've been able to find that shows the construction of the R667. No. This is it right down here. There's a, as you can see, it's just a rebar skeleton. Part of the wall was being built, but it was you know never finished. So what you see at WN65 was being, they were trying to build that here, you know, at WN68A. So, uh, but it was very early in the process and never really got anywhere. And the uh, the gun that was intended for it, you know, would have been a KWK38. And um, if there was ever one that was within the uh, ruined uh, ring stand down here at WN68B, that's what would have been brought back to be used within this one. But I have never found any record of a KWK 38 being stored anywhere for any kind of use or anything. So who knows where that gun went? So that's the Western uh, nest of Les Moulins, you know, WN 68 a and WN 68 B separated by the anti-tank ditch. There's the concertina wire, the barbed mm -hmm. wire. Um, that's what the pattern would have been. Not too much around the uh, actual plateau itself. 
up on the plateau, it was not nearly as spread out as what you see at WN67. So kind of interesting. Um, there is a WN68 photographed on May 31st, 1944. And then there it is on D-Day uh, around mm -hmm. noon. So uh, very interesting. You can see a lot of the construction going on here. There's where the 667 was being built. This right here is where the VK3001 was. Um, trenches all along here. You can see some of the those uh, V patterns em emanating off of uh, the machine gun nest here. This stuff was um, John Sfida. I mentioned him earlier. He and I, have, yeah. we, he provided some of the photos that I'm using for this, some of the aerial stuff from... Um, Thanks, John. Yep, from uh, NCAP, which uh, is, you know, the, the archive for aerial photography. And uh, he and I study a lot of this stuff. So thanks, John, for helping me out with this. You know, you've helped me out with a lot of things before, but, uh, you know, I'm glad that I can credit you for this. So um, now that we've covered that here, I'm just going to go through some photos. Um, this is obviously, this is from the the series of, air, of recon reconnaissance photos taken on May 19th, 1944. This is showing uh, part of WN68, as we can see it over here. Um, continuing, there is uh, St. Cecil right there yep. up on the beach. So this would have been WN68B down here. There is the Roy Day house right there. And so the uh, VK3001 turret would have been in this area. These up here, this is all where those machine gun nests would have been. Continuing on, we have a number. You can see a number of the houses that are actually farther in. You can see um, Le Rizzo, uh house over here that has that uh, concrete wall that we covered in the previous episode way in there. There's uh, Le Sebludon, the house mm -hmm. on WN66. Moving up, we see the uh, customs house here at the construction site of the two casemates at WN67. Um, remnants of um, the Pomard house over here. And then this the plateau up here where WN67 would have been. Again, this right in here would have been right here where my cursor is. That's where the um, the uh, that observation post at WN67 that was built yeah. in response to Aquatint was. As you can see, it's not there now. So this is a photo taken on D-Day approaching Les Moulins. Uh, what's kind of interesting about this as a little side note is that this shows um, trucks from uh, 21 BDS, which was uh, the only British unit that landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Um, beached uh, defense sector, uh, some, you know, uh, RAF ground troops landed yeah. uh, in front of Les Moulins on D-Day. Um, and that's what we're seeing here on, on a rhino ferry right here. Um, but uh, way back here, we can see WN67. We can see, uh, you know, St. Cecil House. We can see Le Cébleu Dans House. See that plateau right over here where WN67 was. This is also on D-Day. This is uh, taken from a boat that's pulling off of... Um, Pulling off from the beach, this right in here is Les Moulins. You can see uh, LCI 92 sitting on the beach that washed up on the shore after it was uh, scuttled. And uh, so this is probably a little bit later in the day. LCT 207 over here. <coughs> Excuse me. I actually know the uh, uh, the son of one of the crew members who was on that boat. And um, so it's interesting to see photos of it. There's LCT 207 as well. Now in this photo the next this is the, the next photo in that series you can see we're a bit farther away from the beach again there's lci 92 then you can see saint cecil over here and then you can see le sebludon over here and then wn67 is up on this bluff right here um this is after d-day this is within uh within les moulins this is the renault uh les renault house and uh there's that concrete wall that's coming off it way back here we can see that pillbox at w at the rear of wn67 that's uh, guarding the road. And then over here, here's all of the ruins of the Pomard house. Uh, some of its wall stone walls remaining. And then all this up here would have been, you know, the, uh, all of the trenches and such of WN67. Uh, troops uh, crawling over the, uh, the ruins of um, the Jean d'Arc house, which actually is what this wall would have connected to this is not uh, rubble from d-day this is rubble from when they destroyed this house the germans did anyway and uh, again you can see all of how their result house is completely battered and bruised i mean the uh the Amer one thing you don't really they don't hear about much of the americans that the tanks that when they were able to they did pound the hell out of these houses because they just didn't want to take any chances obviously so you see a lot of tank fragments and stuff you know tank shells hitting these things and just yeah. obliterating yeah. them 
Um, so another shot of that uh, wall that was blocking that uh, that canal. Here we are looking up at again. This is now this is all post D Day. Um, looking up at that uh, the uh, the plateau of WN sixty seven. A lot of it's just scraped clean. Most of it, you know, Americans did a lot of that. There's some ruins of a uh, uh, of some of the houses within Les Moulins. You can see parts of WN sixty eight back here. There's WN sixty six looking down from WN sixty seven. Uh, obviously, Le Sable Dan house. This is another shot from up on top of WN67. You can see the old customs house down here. And then you can see parts of the R612 that were being built over here. There's a good photo of the old customs house. Mm -hmm. Got just obliterated by a tank round. And again, this house would have been over a, you know 100 years old. This was built during the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, you can tell it's ancient or not ancient necessarily, but old, old as can be. And, uh, you know, a tank or some kind of gun just nailed the hell out of it they weren't taking any chances um this is within les moulins this right here is the anti-tank ditch that was dug this is part of it right here this is facing wn67 right here a lot of tape marked so people don't wander into mines um that's the anti-tank ditch a good shot of it right mm -hmm. there that's saint cecil up there so a yeah, good yeah. view of how they would have built these uh, how they would have had these anti-tank ditches filled with water and surrounded by barbed wire as well, as you can see, you know, there's a good amount of barbed wire running along it. There's Saint Cecil, or I'm sorry, not Saint Cecil, Le Sable Dans. Yep. Right there of WN67 amongst a bunch of boats. We've seen this photo before. Yep, did that of, last uh, time. Yep. Yep. Le Sable Dans, you can see the tanks just shot the hell out of it. And then there's Saint Cecil of WN68B sitting there on the beach. Seems to be okay, but as you can tell, they just blew the hell out of the front of it. You know, the, they weren't having any of it. So, and that house obviously isn't there. There is the uh, VK3001 at WN68 again. And uh, there it is again looking at... Uh, oh, I must have seen that photo labeled as just about every Vedastan's nest from, you know, Sword Beach to Cherbourg <laughs> almost. It, it's a it, famous it, photo, yeah. Yeah. It's a very famous photo. Um, and uh, so here we are showing the, you know, the VK3001 again. There you can see the FT tank uh, turret just sitting down on the ground there. There's the Roy Day house. Some GIs uh, sitting around it. There's that photo again. The reason why I wanted to uh, to show a lot of this at the end here is because if some people might know is that uh, the this this turret this uh, a story about this turret is featured heavily uh, in one chapter of uh, Holger Eckhart's book D Day through German Eyes. Um, however, uh, and it's it's uh, described as uh, what's his name. Um, Gustav Winter, I think, I think is what they, his, his name is in it. And, uh, talks about how this, uh, guy had frostbite on his hands and he was the crew member of this thing and, uh, and all that. But, uh, I'm one of these people who's very skeptical of this book. I don't believe it. And, I, I'm, uh, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that it's all mostly bollocks with it is because it, one or two story that, uh, that, that he kind of extrapolated on, but it's a massive great rabbit hole, but that no one can find who Holger Eckertz is. No one can find a record of his father being a war correspondent. The company nope. that set this book up and sold it seems to have disappeared. It's never been available for interviews. And there's we, Jonathan Ware, Reassess History, did a big tweet about this a couple of years ago, is that and Niels is watching. Niels knows more about Germans in Norma than anybody else I know alive. And mm -hmm. whether it's German veterans, American or British veterans, very few veterans give visceral accounts about blood spurting and, sh and shells exploding. And every account in this book is written like a 12 year old would for a war comic. It's all, it's, it's just too, there's too much sensation. It's and war the terminology porn. being used. didn't come in till after the war. And Anil's did a, a, a big pull apart of it as well. So it sold lots of copies. And if you've got a copy of it, um, you can enjoy reading it, but it, it's mostly fantasy. If not all so, fantasy, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So that's why I bring it up because one of the chapters features the guy, again, his name is Gustav Winter. Um, is a guy that, who manned this, uh, turret in, in this book and he had frostbite on his hands so they had to modify the gun or something he says at one point a round came through the turret and killed the loader even though when you look at every single photo of this turret there is no battle damage on yeah, it at all yeah. um 
so yeah, that's why I put this in here and I as a warning because I when doing a lot of research about this and doing posts on this, I've people have come forward and said, Oh, you, 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 Gustav Vinter was the and guy. And it sold who... shitloads of copies. Yeah. And whoever it was, they made a lot of money for it because it was bestseller lists for quite a long time. And a few authors got caught out because they used the account it in their books and yep. and, and then Causes they realized that it was a little bit too good to be true, unfortunately. Yeah. Was, uh, we are there's an absolute lack of German accounts. If someone finds something new everyone wants to believe it's a good source because there is there's so little compared to the allied accounts and then in this case it just it's 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 just it's just nonsense i think yeah yeah my, yeah. my friend brian who you've had on the show a couple times um he and i were talking the other day and he said we're in the age of uh of you know false history you know because of ai and all that stuff and he's just like we're just going to have to work even harder to to fix all of this crap that's, you know, that, that yeah. does more damage. And yeah, like you say, people then read this book and they put stuff in their book and it's like, now you're even screwing stuff up even more. So yeah, I, I completely agree. That's why I put this in here. So like, don't, I don't want anyone watching this and be like, well, did you know that the guy who, oh, who manned that turret was Gustav Winter? And it's like, no, that is not true. Okay. Don't believe that. that stupid story. I mean, whoever wrote it, <laughs> And, and and Jonathan Ware thinks it was a Brit. He thinks there's a bit of a use of Ang language in there that that gets the that is, is British. But whoever did it, they did do a lot of research. They weren't going into this blindly. They knew their vehicle types and gun types. They knew their units. There's there, there's enough um, constructed fake fact to make it plausible. But actually, as Neil is saying, it's all just nonsense. But it's not like someone didn't go into to this with some some effort to try and make it convincing. It's just, it, it got, yeah. eventually got sorted, but it's still, it's still in the best. It's still there. It's still selling. It's people are still buying it. It's um, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. So uh, I don't know. I, I try to do this so I can, you know, fix a, fix an error. It's, uh, you know, at some point, but yeah. going off of, you know, uh, people, you, you know, stories about this sort of thing, how I had my painting in the uh, previous episode about, WN66. I also have a painting of this specific turret at WN68. Um, did this one a while ago. It's not one of my favorite ones, but it was fun to do. Um, so this is my painting depicting what uh, my interpretation of the VK3001 turret mm -hmm. at WN68. Um, did my best research as I could, but uh, you know, there's part of the crew there. Just This is obviously showing it before D-Day, how it would have looked before D-Day. Um, there's more soldiers wearing drillic, not their uh, not their uniforms they would have been wearing while on duty. Officer using a using a donkey, which is very common. You see that a lot in the area. Um, a member of Organization Tote here, uh, and there's the um, the uh, FT turret sitting there on some planks, as we discussed earlier. But um, so I saw someone say earlier in the chat, like, like well, this would have been slave labor building this stuff. Like, well. Not necessarily slave labor. This would have been construction crews that would have been contracted by Organization Tote, who are these guys right here, to to uh, build these things. Now, it would have been it wouldn't have been nice, you know, it wouldn't have been a nice thing to do. But they would have been paid. Um, they would have been, you know, worked very hard. But it was not. It wasn't like Nordhausen. Let me say that it wasn't, you know, like uh, uh, you know, concentration camp slave labor. If uh, we're gonna get into it. Uh, Paul, do you have anything to touch on with that? Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's very complicated. I mean, at the one end of, of, of a slave labor is absolute forced labor with no yeah. rations being worked to death. And at the other end is is people being paid. They're on a salary that they've, they've got almost kind of unions and stuff. And then there's a whole variety in between. And that's across the whole Third Reich. So it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to put a label on the kind of labor and say what it is. You know, and, and of course, earlier in the war, there, when German Germany is is very much in control of France. Some of these workers from France and Belgium didn't mind, in a sense, getting yeah. work and, and getting a bit of pay for it. And you know, because it's it's time. It's so it's 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 a, it's a war era. There's there's a, there's a shortage of stuff. So it's there's a mixed bag. Uh, but at the very worst end, the slave labor was 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 brutal. We're not we're not saying it wasn't. We're just saying right. there's a there's a spectrum. There's a difference. Yeah, there there's a difference, and uh, I I don't want anyone to, you know. Assume what because I've seen you know people assume certain things and it's like well it, yeah. it's not necessarily the same as this other thing you know I've seen people can yeah. you know say it was like the concentration camp stuff and it's like yeah. no, not not necessarily so we're getting so questions that, about your artwork saying how large are the actual paintings okay well this one right here the the one I had in the previous episode 
Um, that one is 20 by 30. This one I think is like 30 by, you know, I think it's not, I, I forgot the, the dimensions of this one. It's not nearly as big as the other one. It's like, it's like that. So right. about that big, but you know, if you, anyone wants prints of it, I can do it. on. You know, so people Amazon. can get in touch with you and get prints and stuff with this. It's all possible. I'll, so, I, yeah, I put my contact at the end of this, but, uh, but I, that was one element that I wanted to include in this one where the construction crews, because WN68, as we talked about, was very, you know, unfinished. So I, in this painting, I didn't want to depict some of the construction crews that would have been, you know, being brought in to, uh, to work on it. So that's why I have these guys in the foreground heading down towards the areas, you know, where the construction was really happening at WN68. Mm. So that's my presentation as i said in the previous episode contact me send me an email you know just if you want more information on what i have here if you want actual photographs that are featured here or if you want to hit me up for a print of my artwork or anything like that or if you have questions just please email me i'll definitely get i'll respond i believe that all history should be shared i believe all this stuff should be shared i'm not one of those people who wants to just cling on to it and not share it with anyone i think that you know this whole thing should be people should you know, be interacting with each other with this stuff and helping each mm. other out, not uh, trying to, you know, live within the confines of a certain, yeah. uh, you know, uh, imaginary world where it's, it belongs to them because it doesn't belong to anyone. No. And and it, and, it, and if, if we add our little bits and then pass it on, the idea is someone will add their little bits and keep, keep it on moving. And, and I get, you know, I get a bit grumpy at people who don't want to, you know, tour guides I know who don't want to share stories and you know, that's my story. I learned that one. You go, well, are you fighting off the beaches? Because I wasn't. I've I've learned everything I've learned second and third hand. And if we don't pass it on, I'm I'm one of the older guys now. Bizarre. That's how that's happened. That's snuck up on me in the last 20 years. Came here as one of the young, fresh-faced kids doing it, and now I'm the old veteran. You know, it's, it's it comes <laughs> to us all, I guess. But um I'm getting lots of the questions we were getting earlier in the side, sidebar, which kind of beyond what we're going to talk about is the, the one was how effective were these positions on D Well, that is a separate subject, really. But yeah, to sum it up. The fact the Allies won, no, is, is they weren't very effective. Is the is the simple answer, but there's more nuance to that. And Peter O'Connell then said um, the Germans must have anticipated the possibility of their static defense line being outflanked or over what was Plan B. And and this is where the Atlantic Wall isn't necessarily meant to stop the invasion. The Atlantic Wall is 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 meant to kind of delay it enough for the Germans to deal with it with what they've got in land to move it into the right places. In the end. It lasted hours on some beaches, minutes on on others, but it didn't at all pretty much crumble by mid-afternoon on June the 6th. So it really, it didn't, the, the two, two two years of work and the however many hundreds of thousands of tons of, I think it's three and a half thousand bunkers within Normandy the Germans had built, something like that. It didn't yeah. work. What, what's your take on that, Mike? No, I, I agree. Um Obviously, like I say, as you can tell, with there, when it comes to so, excuse me, as I stammer, um, when it comes to all the positions at Omaha, because that's my main field of focus. Yeah, I don't think there was a single one that was finished. You know, when yeah. I look at all the stuff that was being done, so it was. It's like absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's a complete. You know, it's a complete uh, failure because none of it is even close to being done. I mean. I wish I didn't want to mention it, but uh, there was a lot of stuff where I could say, and, and if you look at WN65, it's the same way because there's a lot, there's some stuff at the other, you know, at Colville sur Mer, where there's a lot of things that you can tell, you can see what they're trying, they're going for, for yeah. future, for the future. It's like, okay, clearly this was meant to be a gun here. This was meant to be like this. And they just never reached it. And it's like, if they did, it would have been way more uh, intense for, yeah. the, I mean, <clears throat> for the Americans. Yeah. It's an integrated system that was never fully finished and integrated. And, you know, not that it's a, a, an absolute comparison, but when the Britain has in 1940 the integrated air defense system with the Royal Observer Corps and radar and the control bunkers with the with the sending out the squad, that is a fully integrated system. But if one bit of it fails, like the old a chain is only as strong as the weakest link, the whole system becomes vulnerable. But the German Atlantic Wall if it had got to that point where the communications were set up, the bunkers, all the latest model, they finished all the trenches, they finished all the things there, and they've got the, the troops in there with the, the weapons they're requesting, they've got the frontline weapons there, it could have been a, a much more yeah. of a problem it was. But the Germans have peaked now. I mean, that, that's one of the art. When people say, well, if we'd left D-Day for another year, the Germans would have finished the Atlantic Wall. I, I don't think they would. I think no, you well, could give them another another 10 years. They've, they've re 
providing we maintain the pressure of the strategic bombing on the rail yards and German industry and the factories yeah. and everything else we're doing and, and the economic pressures Germany's under, their, their only real chance to get the Atlantic Wall done was by the end of 1943. If they haven't got it done by then, they're, it, it's all it's all too little too late now. Yeah, and it, it was definitely not even close to being done by June 6th of 44. And, uh, yeah. and you would also need the, you know, if you had one thing that I think is always funny that I see uh, in descriptions of Omaha, one of the things that I, one of the fallacies I see is um, Omaha was covered by, you know, uh, uh, a veteran units or, you know, elite oh. units or something like that. And it's like, no, Don't not at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, right. Yeah. Don't get me started. It's like, not at all. Like, are you kidding me? So much. I mean, you have the seven sixteenth static, you know, and then you mm -hmm. have um, the three fifty second. Now the three fifty second had some veteran uh, NCOs from the Eastern Dumb Front veteran. and such like that. Yeah, but it also had a lot of you know Polish and Czech and uh, you know just uh, also new new uh, members. You know, it didn't have it was not uh, you know it, it was not the German Sixth Army. You know, yeah. like and, and the, 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 you know we've talked about this on the channel a lot. Is that the needle never ends up resting in the middle where it should be in history? It's either it was elite German veteran troops behind Omaha Beach, or they were completely hopeless and shit. It's like, no, no, neither <laughs> of those are true. The no, needle yeah. should be somewhere in the middle, somewhere where there's some experience, there's some new guys, but don't dismiss them as being useless. Like the Atlantic right. Ward is neither brilliant or shit. It's somewhere in that mid area but the, the, between that. And it just, it so frustrates me when we, we get the argument swinging one way, then someone nudges it right the other way. And you go, no, like, like it, it, we're, we're stuck in, it was 80 MG 42s down Omaha beach or no MG 42s. No, no, come, yeah. come on, let's bring it back as Niels could probably jump in right now on the sidebar. There were lots of French machine guns and 08s and MG, but there were also some MG 42s. Although and Niels will correct me if I'm wrong, not in the fixed position. The MG 42s are mostly the ones they have, you know, to move up and down the trenches. But Every time I see that needle about to get in the right place, someone nudges it back the other way, and I go, no, no, it's a, stop it. It's a balancing act, man, yeah. And uh, that, what people need to really learn about, and this applies to everything when it comes to history and life, is that nothing is is absolute. There is, you know, there is, uh, you know, nuance in everything. There is, uh, you know, nothing is simple. Everything is super complicated. There is no just, you know, one black and white, you know, one way or the other. It's uh, yeah. so that's one thing you got to realize. And yeah, it's a. Uh, it, and it, you and me and John Savedo and others, we're always like hovering those. Facebook is the worst, I think, for the it is for the disaster of Omaha Beach. And God bless all those boys who like it was. There was some guy a few weeks ago going about the disaster plan of why did the Allies send in those men to I've their those suicidal before. deaths? And you go, what the hell are you talking about? How do you think? <laughs> you get an amphibious landing to work without people dying. That is, it's it's horrible for the families of those who die. Yeah. That, this is how war works. That's a war, you know? man. Well, <laughs> it's 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 funny. Um, But he, the thing is, that's funny too, is that it's not like those troops were, you know, heading there knowing they're going to die necessarily, you know, because yeah. they thought the places were going to be bombed. They thought the fighting yeah. was going to happen in land. And um when I read most yeah, of that was on Brad's I, comment, that one, the, 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 who sent them into their deaths. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And uh, well, I, I, I saw him one, not too long ago, some idiot Navy seal on the Joe Rogan experience. And uh, he was talking about, uh, he was talking about saving private Ryan and he's talking about, he's like, well, the thing is that was, they just, that was what they had to accept that that was their, the situation that they were all going to just be shot once those doors went down. It's like, that is no, that, that no one's going to go in there just saying, okay, I guess we're all going to die now. You know, it's like, that's, that's ridiculous, dude. That's not how it was planned. That's not what they were. Ex that's not what they were expecting. If you read a lot of the memoirs, I think there was one of the Rangers, uh, they were singing uh, wedding songs to a guy who had just gotten married as they were going in. You know, it was like they expected the fighting to go to be inland. They didn't expect yeah. to just the doors to go down and for everyone to be shot by a million machine guns like how that movie shows. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we go down the whole rabbit hole of of, of, the, of Atu and Kiska in, in early 43 when the Americans and Canadians land there. And at the end of the day, whatever it was, there are 300 men killed at the invasion force of mm -hmm. 15,000 or something. And people say, oh, terrible. The Japanese had gone. The Japanese had left. The, the, the casualties were all incurred under the umbrella banner of what I call shit happens. 
<laughs> yeah, which, which is someone gives the wrong water coordinates. Someone dies of a heart attack. A ramp of a landing craft hits some other bloke on the head and kills him. Okay, yeah, guy somebody drowns. Yeah, decapitated by a cable whiplashing across there, and all the, that's what happens if if you have, as we had, one hundred and fifty six thousand men landing on the beaches on D Day. Even if there were no Germans for twenty miles, <laughs> there direction, would have been an accident. There still yeah. would have been deaths because that's what happened. Bombs drop in the wrong place. Ammunition goes off. All that kind of stuff. And and when I see these th these things, we're going down this you know rabbit hole. Oh, it was a tragedy, but yeah, tragedy for the families. But it's a, pl a plan can be successful even though men get killed. That that's literally as you said that's how wars are fought yep. you can't have a, a battle with 100 percent uh no one killed or wounded that well i mean no people get killed in basic training you know <laughs> so yeah it's, so, uh... you know we're, we're going down that thing there but basically rob crane is asking when are you starting on the other beaches <laughs> <laughs> oh finished man Omaha yet rob <laughs> Well, I, I don't know when you consider Omaha finished, um, but uh, yeah, obviously we haven't gone over Colville yet, but um, the uh, the eastern side of Omaha in terms of an episode like this. But, uh, you know, you brought up something interesting that I'd like to do, you know, is eventually do actual, you know, D-Day, what it would have been like for the American, yeah. what go like minute by minute for certain units or something like that would be a lot of fun because that's something that I am still... I'm still doing a lot of the German uh, and French stuff, you know, covering the defenses, covering the towns and all that stuff. And then eventually I do want to do like insane deep dives on, you know, minute by minute, because like I know people who are have access to archives, like my good friend and producer Myra Miller. She has yep, she has yep. incredible access to archives. She's gotten me morning reports with like a snap of a finger. So um, I could get all kinds of archives from her and such. And she's, you know, she loves this kind of stuff, too. So it would be. uh it would be really cool, and that's well. There, uh, there is a big produ uh, production starting for animated versions of all five landing beaches for next June that I have been asked to be a part of the advisory team, and I said really? I'm not doing it unless I can bring in my experts for my sector because I can't do it all myself. So you and Joe, Joe Balkowski are my two Omaha guys. That's and awesome. They want to great. They want to have it, and you know, so each beach sector by sector, you know, June. So Brad's on my Juno list. I haven't. I've got to have a ne another meeting. So there, there is that there are these things that are going to be happening um, to, to, to get this stuff down to a level that is, is acceptable. I mean, there's obviously a certain amount of level of detail. We can't go, we, we can't individually plot, you know, U S infantry, single individual soldiers on Omaha beach, but we now have a very good idea of which companies were where at what time and what they were facing and what the timeline is. And, you know, there's some, we, we, there's incredible work done with um, Stephen Fisher, who's doing his sword beach book. Mm. who's got he's either invented it himself or he's found it where he now if he can if he can determine the height of a wall that is casting a shadow in a 1944 photo today he can work out the uh, the the time of day that photo was taken by the length of the shadow oh that's awesome see that's something um, i've thought about trying to do but the fact that he actually knows how to do it that's you know so i'll put in touch with him so he, so so he so providing he's got something to measure uh, the measure the shadow against if he can see it goes across the wall and hits this wall there. And he can now see on Google Earth that that wall, and, he, and you know, it's people like me going out there. Stuart, um, a friend of ours, um, Stuart Bertie, who's a photographer, he used the gadget because he's an architect to measure the height of, I think it was the Leon Sur Mare church for him back in June, the exact height. So he could now use that to get a shadow to cart to work. And he was the one who helped James Holland with his Sherwood Rangers book to, to work out exactly what time I think it was a troop took their Shermans through the village of Ver Ver Mare because of the shadows. Oh, that's so he cool! It was, and he said it was, and he was he could he got it down to like it was eleven twelve. <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit, you're good. Because there's a website. I mean, obviously, awesome. all this stuff, all this data is out there. There's a, there's data out there showing what where the sun was are at what are, 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 for every day for every year going back for two hundred years. So you can do this stuff. So it's. It's insane what can be done where we used to just say this photo was taken in the morning and then <laughs> nothing <laughs> to base on. Now we can go, yeah, no, it was taken at 8.46. Um, so My nerdism is through the roof right now. It's so cool. Yeah, and that's, you know, we've talked about before. That's where people like you are taking this to, to another level. And, you know, I can go and see stuff because I'm, I'm going to Omaha tomorrow to get ready to, pre to be recce for next week. But it's the spending the time on the photos. It's spending the time and, and looking at it and comparing it and realizing where we're, where we're going. So um, brilliant. We're um, 
we will leave things at that and then we'll work on a Colville show for some time, maybe after Christmas or something. And but what yep. we might do, I, well, I will invite you back at some point. I don't know when it's going to be near Christmas. I'm doing a 12 myths of Christmas kind of thing. Oh, nice. <laughs> where I'm going to be on for like four or five hours and the historians are going to come on for 20 minutes each or something and we'll have worked out in advance what the myth is you're going to bust. So have Ooh, a think about what that. fun you want to do. And we'll do the other 12 minutes. And we're going to do things like Britain was alone in 1940 and, and that kind of stuff. So, so if you've got one for that, you know, we'll do I, that. I, I have a few, so I'll, I'll pitch them to you and you can tell me what you think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if they're quickly, you can do two or three, but that we thought yeah. would be kind of a nice light show for Christmas, um, you know. So anyway, there we are, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a break now, so I'll be back in the second week of October. Uh, my tour group has already started to arrive in Normandy. I'm with there. And, um, yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for your yeah, brilliant comments, folks. And Thank I you. will see you all next time. It's Paul Ware for World War II TV saying, when I'm away not um, streaming, go back and find the cool shows in the back catalogue. Cheers, everybody. Bye.